Good. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. Thank you for those joining us live and also those on Zoom. It's always good for us to study God's Word and really good to be back. Uh, we are considering the end of uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2 this afternoon, which is going to be really good. Um, but before we start, we should pray and thank the Lord for this very important and special time. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the opportunity, Lord, that we have to be together. Lord, it's always a special time to study your word together. We thank you, Lord, for your grace and mercy to us. Thank you, Lord, for giving us brothers and sisters in Christ that we can join together with and we can study your word together. We just thank and praise you for today. We pray that everything said and done will bring you honor and glory. We pray that you will speak to our hearts and help us, Lord, to hear what you have to say and also apply it in our lives as well. In your wonderful name we pray, the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Mm -hmm. Good. So we're going to consider 2 Timothy chapter 2 and just read from verse 19 to 26. So I'm just going to read here from, from verse 19. Nevertheless, the solid foundation of God stands, having the seal. The Lord knows those who are his, and let everyone who names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. But in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay, some for honor and some for dishonor. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from the latter, he will be a vessel for honor, sanctified and useful for the master, prepared for every good work. Flee also youthful lusts, but pursue righteousness, faith, love, peace with those who call on the name of the Lord out of a pure heart. But avoid foolish and ignorant disputes, knowing that they gender, generate strife. And a servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but be gentle to all, able to teach, patient in humility, correcting those who are in opposition. If God perhaps will grant them repentance, so that they may know the truth. And that they may come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil, having been taken captive by him to do his will. So, um, yeah, very important, these concluding thoughts of the chapter for us, as, as Paul writes to Timothy. I think there's some really important thoughts for us today. And please, if you have a question, uh, please ask so we can we deal with that, because maybe someone else has a question of the same nature and that will answer that. For them as well. So when you look at verse verse 19, it sort of concludes with what has been said before. And as we can look at verse 16, 17, 18, it's dealing with false teaching and false teachers. Um, look at verse 18, those who've strayed concerning the truth, saying that the resurrection is already past, and they overthrow the faith of some. But then when you look at verse 19, it says, Nevertheless, the solid foundation of God stands, having the seal, the Lord knows who are his, and everyone who names the name of Christ apart from iniquity. Now, it's key there is the foundation, and that thought we have in 1 Corinthians 3 as well. It's, it's quite interesting that, that Paul would write that the Lord knows those who are his. And it's sort of not the way that... Jesus would have spoken in the Gospels because Jesus in the Gospels clearly said those who don't show works meet for, for repentance or those that are not going to be fruitful are going to be cut off and thrown into the fire. It's a very strong emphasis there. And if you don't just cut off here, yeah, it's saying, yes, there's false teaching. Yes, there are false teachers, but don't be too concerned because the Lord knows who he is. Because why? Because of the foundation. Because whether there's false teaching or not, it doesn't change the foundation. And therefore, in the notes, I just said what a blessed verse this is. Because despite false teaching and false teachers, the solid foundation stands. So that's important because even if someone is wrapped up into false teaching, it doesn't mean they're not saved. The issue with false teaching is not the, for you who believe the false teaching or live in it. The issue is what you pass on. That's the dangerous thing. Because you might be saved and be involved in false teaching, but what you are then sharing with others causes them not to be saved or them to be going astray. 
So the issue is what you pass on. But that's why Paul is saying, don't be too concerned in the fact of, of be panicked about it because the foundation of, of, of Christ stands and Christ is that foundation. So if you turn with me to 1 Corinthians 3, so it's a thought that we'll see quite often in, in the next few verses. So in 1 Corinthians 3, <laughs> um, you got the, I, I sort of listed the whole passage there. Um, but specifically verse 11 is what I want to focus on. Um, for it says, for no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. And of course, the context then of that is dealing with the judgment seat of Christ, the rewards the Christian will receive, that even if you suffer loss because you have been involved in a false teaching mm. or have not fulfilled your, your calling, the foundation still stands. Your salvation is still secure. And that's important. And it's important for us not to get panic because our responsibility is not to put people in a spiritual headlock the responsibility is to share the truth and sometimes we feel we are responsible for saving people you can't save anyone you just have to declare they don't take it it's it's up to them so um in the notes i just said we don't have to judge the salvation of others and that's important it's not really our place to judge the salvation of other people and not saying that you can't say that. So if someone says, do you think that person's saved? Not the no type of thing. It's fine to say that. It doesn't mean you're going to be judged for that. But the issue is if you're going to spend your time trying to play a game of who's saved and not saved, it's just a waste of your time. It's mm -hmm. not your job. And to get some people that are like the spiritual police that just want to go around and be judgmental on people's salvation, please, if that's what you're doing, then really literally wasting your time mm -hmm. because that's not our jobs. Okay, so we don't have to judge the salvation of others. God knows those who are his and who are in him. It's, it's God's to know and God's to, to cherish. It's not for us to, to be too concerned about that. But, but, there's always a but, but look at the end of this. That being said, it says, let everyone who names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. So it's saying that it's not your job to go around judging, even those who are maybe involved in false teaching. It's not your job, job to judge if they're saved or not. But the key is that in my, so it's not my job to look outward. So I'm not here to point fingers at other people. However, in my own life, I should not give opportunity for others to point a finger at me. Whether it's right or wrong, it's not the conversation yet. It's just saying that those who name the name of Christ should depart from evil, depart from iniquity, so that other people don't question my salvation. So I mustn't give reason for people to question. Because that comes with the Christian walk is to depart from iniquity. So just because your salvation is secure, just because you're built on the foundation of Christ and you're saved by grace, does not mean that gives you a license or gives you an excuse to live in sin so that others can judge because it does affect your testimony. And whatever affects your testimony will have an impact on the wider scope of the gospel. And that's important. Because we will be held accountable. And that's why it's it's a very, very serious issue. If ch the church itself starts becoming involved in false teaching that leads to sinful behavior, that leads to all these things. Because if it's church-wide, it's a very, very big problem. And it must be called out. Even if it's uncomfortable. Because the command is that we must depart from all iniquity. And so that's important. Again, it doesn't, it's not about your salvation here because your salvation is secure. It's about your testimony that is still important because God has called us to righteousness and to holiness. And that's very, very important and key here because then look at verse 20 because then Paul builds on this. And verse 20 says, but in a great house, and it just links the, the church with the house, which is very interesting. So, but in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay, some for honor and some for dishonor. So the context there, of course, is in ancient times, you would have, they didn't have plastic. And so what would happen is that in a house, you would have nice vases and cutlery and you know, things like that that are precious and nice and, and, and really sort of for decorations or for use that's, that's positive. 
but then also if you didn't have a plastic bag to take out the rubbish so the rubbish would be put in a, another type of jar or container so whether it's it's food that's you know has to be thrown out or discarded of i mean i didn't don't even want to think about waste because there weren't toilets and stuff whatever that might be you have vessels that are not really things you want people to see and you have other vessels that you want people to see. So if you look at verse 19, where the important context is, if a Christian is not departing from iniquity, if a Christian is not departing from evil, they become a vessel of dishonor. Which means you're still part of the house, but God can't put you front and center and use you. You are far more there to take up the rubbish as a vessel. Because you don't put that vessel out when, when visitors come. Oh, sorry, I'm gonna we're gonna drink out of this, and this is actually used for other other purposes. Because you can't do that. And therefore, there is accountability here for what we want to do. And the problem is that all of us want to, if if you truly know Christ and want to serve Him, you want to say, I want to be used of Him. But if you're going to live your life on your own terms and not be concerned about Christ and only be concerned about selfish ambition, God cannot use you. And if you want to put yourself in the forefront to be used of God, and you're still selfish and self-focused, what's going to happen to that sort of ministry or thing you're involved in? It's going to crash and burn. Because God only honors those who honor him when it comes from a ministry perspective. So many churches struggle when it comes to the minister, when it comes to the people in the church, because people are doing it out of selfish ambition. And so the people put themselves forward because, you know, I want to do this for the Lord. But you're doing it out of selfish motives. And then everything in the church just starts falling apart. Because you have vessels of dishonor that want to put themselves forward to be used for honorable means. And so that's what he's saying here in verse 20 in this in this great house. And as I said, he, he uses the context of, of the church now as, as a house, the house of God. I, I wanted to, sorry for the typo, I wanted to say house of the Lord. I just put house of the God. So please excuse that. But in a house, you have these vessels. And then you again, you've got here, you've got, again, quite interesting. If we get to 1 Corinthians 3, which is very much connected to some of these thoughts. Remember that at the judgment seat of Christ, you'll present your work to be gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, or stubble. Now, gold, precious, gold, silver, and precious stones are the good things that go through the fire and is refined. Wood, hay, and stubble are things that are burnt up. Look here as well at the vessels here. Vessels of gold and silver, but also wood and clay. Because the vessels generally that are, that are wood and clay are the ones that are used for taking out the rubbish and trash. Not the honorable ones. Mm. And again, this is not for me to stand there or for anyone else to point a finger. It's for God. God it will manifest itself very quick. It manifests itself in church very, very quickly if people are vessels of honor or dishonor. And so people are, oh, you know, this and that, and they moan. It's a pretty simple thing. You know, it's, it's funny. I, I spoke to Harry. It was quite funny. Harry, the other day, spoke to someone. And he said to me afterwards, actually, said to Vera, that that person's quite funny because they're telling off their child, but with a smiley face, but they're actually being rude because he was perceptive enough to realize the body language. And so the body language is not matching the words make sense so you could pick up the body language saying I'm, I'm upset but the words are trying to sort of couch it but he could read through it now i'm using an example in church people see straight through mm -hmm. us they see straight through you can try and put a put your best foot forward and put up a nice face but people if people avoid you like the plague there are reasons why they avoid you because they can see that it's not sincere and that goes with your quiet time, time with the Lord, your commitment, your focus, all that stuff. We cannot hide that stuff. And therefore, again, when, when it comes to people saying to me, well, why are things not happening for me? Well, things might not be happening for you spiritually or positionally or whatever, because maybe there's some work that still needs to be done. So so that's quite, quite strong here for what 
what Paul is saying to Timothy, because Timothy's ministering in the church, and he's saying, don't worry, because in the church, you'll still have vessels of honor and dishonor. In the church, we're going to have those who are not spiritually mature and those who are more mature. And please, as I've said before, let other people tell you you're spiritually mature. Don't tell yourself you're spiritually mature, because that's a sign of spiritual immaturity. But basically, you have various people at various phases of their spiritual growth, those who actually want to serve the Lord out of sincere hearts, those who want to serve the Lord, but there's a bit of them in it, and those who have different motives. And you've got all this mix in church. That is the church. So people say, I go to church and people are funny. Yeah, because people are funny in church. That's what church is. Church is a funny place. Because you don't know what people's motives are. What are people's motives? Sometimes they don't have friends, and the church is the only place where they can make friends. Mm -hmm. So, so, you know, if you're coming to church, expecting it to be this perfect place where everyone's super spiritual and just it, it's all about each other and about Christ and not about us, then you're missing the wrong, you're in the wrong place. Because church is going to have some different aspects to it. And all of us need to look at our hearts, look at our motives, and look at us and say, are we vessels of honor or dishonor? What am I doing? And why am I doing it? That's just what we have to do. And guess what? If you are a vessel of dishonor and you're doing it for selfish motives, don't worry, we have to bear with you anyway. Doesn't matter. That doesn't, that's not the issue. The issue is just for yourself. And so he writes to Timothy about this because you have to deal with it in church. And I think those who are spiritually mature hopefully will realize that and not always get frustrated or irritated because people are difficult or people are awkward. People are going to be awkward in church. That's what church <laughs> is. And if you are the pastor, you don't, I don't have luxuries of going, oh, well, I want this person. Yeah, no, I don't want that person. I don't have those luxuries. And so the members of the church should not have that luxury. And if we have people in the church who say, well, that person should be and that person shouldn't be, the minister doesn't have that luxury. And therefore, the members of the church can't have that luxury. Who's here? Who's here? So those are all the realities. We can't sort of say, oh, that's the minister's minister must deal with this stuff. I don't want. No, no, it's all our responsibilities. And all of us have to get over ourselves for the church to function properly. Because that's what it's saying. There are good vessels and there are difficult vessels. And some people aren't even a vessel yet. But we have to deal with it. All right. And that it moves on here in verse 21. Because now it gets to the key issue for me. Because all we do is we think of works. So the vessel of honor is the one that lives a good life, and the vessel of dishonor is the one that lives an irresponsible, sinful life. That's what we think, but I think it's deeper than that. It's the same as when we get to 1 Corinthians 3. We deal with the rewards we're going to get. Everyone thinks if Mother Teresa is going to get a lot of rewards, if she's even there. But basically the issue is we think because you're doing charity work or good works, then God's going to honor the good works. I don't think that's specifically what it's dealing with. It's dealing with your testimony which is far more related to your character and growth and the outpouring of that in what you're doing instead of physically because I gave someone 10 quid when they needed 10 quid. Makes sense. It's not about charity work. It's about from the character that something is birthed within us that grows out and what we are doing comes from a pure motive because spiritually we are growing and that God can see why we're doing what we're doing. That God knows when we are praying. He knows when we're spending time with him. We know when we're thinking of others. That when we look at them, our desire is for them to grow. Our desire is for them to hear. Our desire is for what's best for them, not what's best for me. God knows that. That whatever you're doing comes from that good place. That one day when we stand before the Lord, the Lord can say, you've built a godly edifice in everything that you did. Why? Because yes, you are broken, but your desire was to serve me. Where other people do a lot of great things, their house looks fantastically big, but it's made of wood, and it's going to be burnt up. And I think verse 21 gives us a clue to this, because it says, therefore, if anyone cleanses himself, think, how do we cleanse ourselves? If you just took it like that and didn't read it in context, it's quite funny. Cleanse yourself. How do you do that? So if anyone cleanses himself from the latter, he will be a vessel of for honor, sanctified, and useful for the master, prepared for every good work. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from the latter, what is the latter? I think the latter is referring to what has been said in 16, 17, 18. Yeah, let's look. Yeah, 
So let's look at verse 16. So you've got profane and idle babblings. You've got those who strayed concerning the truth. Because what he's talking about is people that are being exposed and engrossed in false teaching. Because they're listening to Arminius and Philetus. What you need to cleanse yourself of is false doctrine. What you need to cleanse yourself of is teaching that's going to lead you astray. Because look at what it says in verse 18 here. Because it's, they've overthrown the faith of some. Doesn't mean the people are not saved. It just means they've gone astray. So if you cleanse yourself of false teaching and things that will lead you astray, you then can become a vessel of honor. Because I believe doctrine is directly connected to your discipleship. False doctrine leads to wrong discipleship. And therefore, what you must cleanse yourself of is teaching that is contrary to the word of God and contrary to what Paul especially gave to Timothy. Because if you are involved in that, it's going to lead you astray. Because if anyone cleanses himself from the latter, which is the false teaching referred to previous, he will be a vessel for honor and then sanctified and useful for the master, prepared for every good work. Why? Because God can use those who know the truth. He can use those who share the truth. How many people actually know what the gospel really is? Hmm. And they call themselves Christians. Of course, we're all Christians. But if you ask someone, what's the gospel? You know what the gospel is. What's grace? You wouldn't know what that is. Hmm. Who is the person of Christ? So that's why I mentioned, I spoke um, to Jehovah's Witness on Monday, Tuesday. Monday, Tuesday, Tuesday, Tuesday. I spoke to the guy on Tuesday. He's the main guy here in Marla. He's looking the whole time. I've been looking for him for months. And then I found him. And I said, you know, Vera was in the park. I did some work and just said hello to them. And I said to Vera, you stay there with Harry. I've got him. I went to him and I went to speak to him. It was so interesting. Once again, it, he affirmed what I knew, but it was just amazing because he wasn't, he was very, very good. He knew verses. He wasn't someone... I'd spoken to certain people previously who weren't qualified. That was an easy talk. Second group, second guy, also easy. This guy wasn't it. Because he knew scriptures. And what was interesting is if you listen to him, other than his works-based salvation, which it is, it's completely his works-based. But take that aside. When he gets to the, the cross, he will say everything that most Christians say. Jesus is the only sacrifice. It's only through Jesus that you are saved. Jesus came and died for your sins to make you right with God. He says all of that. But the one key difference, of course, is he doesn't believe in the person of Christ and who he truly is. He doesn't believe that the sacrifice is fully complete. But he says all the right Christian jargon. But yet, doesn't know the truth. Now, the sad part is that when it comes to doctrine here in verse 21, how many Christians would know that doctrine? Therefore, that's what God's going to hold us accountable for. Because we cannot live, we've got 365 give or take days every single year. And many Christians are moving into five, six years now since you've heard something and we haven't investigated. If we hear something in church on a Sunday, God gives us time to go and read the scriptures again to know it. But we go five years, 10 years. It's been 15 years now for many of us when you've heard something. For 15 years, we haven't read the scriptures. For 15 years, the Bible's been next to our bed and often looks like, um, you know, the car. I've seen that car that says, wash me, when someone writes in the dust. And some Bibles have so much dust on the top, it says, read me. And it might not be you here on the Bible, side, of course, because I'm just saying in general that God's going to hold us accountable, not if you only have John 3.16 and the Amazon, then he holds you accountable for what you have there. But if you have the whole Bible and we haven't taken any time to read it or even be concerned about doctrine, concerned about why Christ died, concerned about what grace really is, concerned about what the gospel is that we're sharing, why is it powerful? Concerned about what it actually means to be regenerate. 
If we don't, are not concerned about these things, how can we stand before the Lord one day and sort of say, yeah, we've done our best? And God's not asking much of physical effort. He's just asking you, read. Spend time. And therefore, here in verse 21, we have to cleanse ourselves of false doctrine. And I, I'm going to sort of paraphrase that. So please, if I'm wrong, the Lord could strike me down. I don't know. But I'm saying cleanse yourself of stuff you've heard in Sunday school that could be incorrect. Mm -hmm. Cleanse yourself of teaching that has not been correct. And let's get back to the scriptures. Because then we can become holy and honorable and sanctified vessels prepared for every good work. Because look, look. It's quite interesting. I, I don't have it in the notes. Yeah, I do. I, yeah, I'm so sharp. I'm so sharp. I just had it in my thought. I can't remember if it was in the notes. Ephesians 2.10. If you look at verse uh, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, for by grace you have been saved through faith, um, not of works, lest anyone should boast. And then it says that we are his workmanship. So let's, let's look at that passage. Because it's so important. So by grace you have been saved through faith, and not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works. And what, why, why does it say created? Because what does 2 Corinthians 5 say? Verse 17, all those who are in Christ are a new creation. So we are created in Christ Jesus for good works. Mm -hmm which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. And what's the good works? Not giving money to the poor. That is good, but that's not the good works it's referring to here. <laughs> good works is godly works. The things that the Bible says we must do, and part of your good work is to grow in knowledge and understanding of the will of God, which is in Colossians chapter 1, verse 9 to 10. So part of good works is to study God's word. Because mm -hmm. if we don't study God's word, we're not going to know what to do and how to live and how to honor him. So it's quite sad that many people think now they're a Christian, I must now go and do good things, but they don't spend time to read God's word, to draw from mm. his word what those good things must be. Therefore, it's serious. And then he continues in verse 22, I found beautiful, important, really exciting what it says. It's, it's amazing. And I think that this is where the church has failed, in my opinion. Verse 22. Especially youth ministries fail. So it says, flee also youthful lusts, but pursue righteousness, faith, love, peace with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. So what happens is normally when you speak to young people, in general, maybe in church, you've got one of those banging the pulpit ministers who tell everyone their sin is horrible. You know, those churches. Um, when Marlow people generally do the right thing. But it says yeah, in verse 22, flee youthful lusts. So you'll stand up and speak to young people, preach in a church and tell people you've got to move away from lusts, and evil and sinful things. So flee those things. And then you stop there. So yes, great. I flee sin. I flee lust. Then what? How, how do I flee it? No, you must run away from it. Okay. So how do you run away from a thought? You can run away from a bad place. You can run away from bad people. And you can't run away from a bad thought. How can you run away from a bad feeling? You have to get caught up in um, doing the work of God. Yeah, so see, so that's what it says here. Look look at the contrast. Flee youthful lust, but do what? So it says flee from the one thing and pursue the other. So run away from the one and run toward the other. So how do you encourage young people to stay away from bad things? You don't tell them stay away from bad things. You tell them to run toward good things. But we miss that point, don't we? Because all people here in the church is don't, don't do this. You're so bad. We don't, we don't do this. Telling the people what not to do, which is fine in a general sense. But the way that you counteract not doing is rather to do. But we don't hear that message. So you go to every youth camp and youth talk, and all it is about temptation 
and the things they've got to stay away from and how many youth camps and youth talks and youth programs are saying, let's get to the book of Ephesians. Let's get to the book of Philippians. Let's get to the book of Colossians mm -hmm. and tell you about who Christ is and your position in Christ that you can have as a believer. But no, no, that's too deep. Rather, let's keep telling them, don't, 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 don't. And also the example of the um, older congregation as well for the young people to take notice of with regards to if the, if the older congregation are well versed in the word. Definitely. They're going to say, well, what is, what is it to, to pursue? Yeah, because the old, old generation will always just think, you know, oh, you must be careful of this and that. But the world's changed. What hasn't changed is what we must pursue. But what has changed is what you flee from. Yeah. Makes sense. So whether you lived 2,000 years ago, 1,000 years ago, this pursuing process is still the same, which is what? As it says here, pursue what? Righteousness. Pursue faith and love and peace. I'm going to get to the end part there. So what are these things we must pursue? And I put them in the notes. So again, I said, this is this is where, I, I mean, I put myself in those shoes because I did youth ministry. I ran a youth ministry for more than a decade. And all I did was trying to tell people not to watch Harry Potter. <laughs> and I would run, you know, weeks on Harry Potter talks and witches and ghouls and goblins and all this type of stuff. Don't do this and be careful of drugs and drink. And all, all you spend your time doing is focusing on things that are negative. And what you know what gets you? Nowhere. I'm not saying we shouldn't talk about those things. But if you weigh up your ministry, if you spend more time telling people about the occult and the evil stuff, you never get to the good stuff. And some people are consumed so much with evil and trying to tell people all the bad stuff in the world, they never get to their position in Christ. Because the only way we can live righteous lives is if we're drawing from heaven, if we're drawing from Christ and drawing from our position in him. And young people can look up and say, yes, this is bad stuff, yeah, it draws me away, but I must remind myself to where? Look up. That's the only way. And so I would spend 10 years in the youth ministry and make Zero progress. All the effort, all the blood, all the sweat, all the tears, all the numbers with zero progress. Because you never tell them the good things. And so here it says, and it said, my desire for young people to know this verse, flee. Not fight, but flee. Fight temptation. Where? Let's say fight temptation. You can't fight temptation. Once you're in the midst of temptation, you're done. You've got to flee it. The only one who could fight temptation was the Lord Jesus Christ. And he showed us how strong he is to overcome. No one else is called to fight temptation. You don't put yourself in the position of temptation and fight. it. That would just be foolish. So sin is too difficult to fight. And that's what I believe the older generation don't understand. Because it's very difficult for evil, per se, to find the older generation. Because there was no TV. If you wanted to find something dodgy, it would be hard work to go and find it. Yes, you could physically find it, but it couldn't come into your bedroom. No. It couldn't come into your home without. And that's what young people are exposed to today. So you, if you wanted to stop them from what? Okay, not having, you're not allowed to have a phone. Okay, till when? not allowed to have a TV till when. You can't do that. The only hope you have is to draw them to Christ so that he works and the thirst and the hunger is for him to draw them away from that, uh, those other things. It's the only hope you have. Otherwise, you've got no hope. So it's too difficult for young believers, for young people. And that's why we cannot keep preaching topical nonsense in the church. You can't do that. You're going to run yourself into trouble. Because what young people need to know is the word. They don't need to know more topics. And so you, you think you're very cute and you think you're very hip to start talking about topics, but we never teach the word. The only ammunition you have is not information, it's the word. Because people know what's wrong and right. They know the bad stuff. I don't have to keep telling people. 
I mean, I don't need to run a six week course on transgender stuff. Everyone with, you know, a couple of brain cells to rub together realizes it's madness. It's a waste of my time to talk about that stuff. It really is. You might talk generally, just drop it in there, but I don't have time to sit for six weeks and talk about that. Because it's just, it's logic. So it goes on to so say, it's not about just fleeing, but what needs to be pursued. And that's why I firmly believe this. I believe the Christian life needs to be an, a, a sort of offensive life instead of a defensive life. Mm -hmm. which means pursue righteousness on the front foot for that which is right. And that's going to become easier for you to not get engrossed in the negative. Instead of sitting there the whole time way, telling yourself, oh, I must stay away from this and that. Rather do what is right. That's going to be far more productive. I mean, it's interesting, isn't it? Because, um, you know, also the Bible, you get um, these men and women of God even and they, they sort of fall. And what, what we lose sight of is that um I think that um like with the temptation stuff and all that, that the devil you know he's he's a lot cleverer than we think. Yeah, he's very clever. And, and and the thing we're weaker and we like to think we'll just sort of yeah we'll be strong. No no you know good no we know, no, no, no. Knows. Good no. and in fact because it says in the Bible to don't don't take up Head on the devil with them or the demon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Look at Jude, he says, you know, it's not for you to do that. No. Not no. even Michael did it. No, that's right, exactly. So we understand. Yeah, hundred percent. And I think the issue is that the problem with us is the fact that we are physical. So what happens is you're going to be hungry, lonely, tired. We are sensory yeah. beings. Yeah. Makes sense. And you can't fight sensory stuff. No. You can't. You, so basically, let's say you're fasting. Let's say people fast. I don't fast, but let's say they fast. And you walk into, <laughs> you can't be walking into a burger joint when you're fasting. No. <laughs> Makes sense. It's, it's over yeah, it's, it's <laughs> Because you can't fight it. You're, you're going to be, you know, you can try and push yourself there. But let me tell you, if you sit for two hours while you're fasting in a burger joint, you're walking out with, with, with ketchup on your mouth. <laughs> um, it's just how it is. Um, but, but look at the key. So let's look at what you must pursue. Pursue righteousness. What is that? You can't pursue your own righteousness. You can't no. pursue doing right. That doesn't work. But what you pursue is the righteousness of Christ to grow in his righteousness that's imparted to you. Also, grow in, you pursue faith. And what is that faith? That faith is spiritual growth. Because can your faith grow? Yes, it can. Because your faith is connected here to trust. When you know God's character, you trust him more. Because you know him. And then also love, which is God's love. Pursue God's love. And also peace, which is Romans 5.1. Peace with God. Pursue that. And you do that as well through confession. Because what happens is you have initial peace with God in your salvation. But you can also have daily peace with God when you confess your sins. But look at the beautiful part. This is the part where it gets quite interesting because what's going to happen is in our world, you've got two types of people. You can have those Christians who are sound Christians who understand the church, and you're going to have some people who are sound who don't like the church. Because if you've been in church for long enough, you will be burned somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. And you've got many Christians who don't want to go to church, not because they're unspiritual, but because they, they see it as a dangerous place. Hmm. Doctrinally, it's dangerous. People are dangerous, and it's a day. And what's going to happen is they're going to rather stay at home watching good teaching, but rather be at home, yeah, because they like they, they can't afford going to church, and that's a reality. But here's the issue with not having some form of fellowship, and this is the dangerous thing. Is it says flee youthful lusts and pursue righteousness, faith, love, peace. But can you pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace on your own? Mm -hmm. Continually? No. How should we do it? What is the purpose of the church? With those who call upon the Lord out of a pure heart. So you can do it for short periods. It's fine. Mm -hmm. And I'm 100% with that. I'm not going to go to a rubbish church to go to church. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. I put my foot down. I'm not going to do that. But I have to realize the danger. 
Because yeah. when I'm alone on my own and I don't have any form of fellowship, yeah. and online counts as fellowship if you can talk to people. I'm talking about being able to talk and pour out your, yeah. it doesn't have to be always, I have to physically be with someone. You can be online with someone yeah. as well and talk to them. Yeah. But you need to have interaction and, and, and accountability. Yeah. Yeah. Accountability, encouragement. Because if you don't have that, you're basically a sitting duck. Yeah. But you can be just yeah, hundred percent. Sure. Hundred percent is difficult, but that's what you have to pursue as well. You have to say this is important. So short term, you can say maybe I'm not going to do that, but in the long run, you need to find at least one or two or three. Even if it's a home group, it doesn't yeah. have to be a big church, but you need to have exactly. people that you can bounce things off, be accountable with, that people can pray with you, encourage you. So that's all I'm saying is it doesn't have to physically be a big bulk. It and, just means it has to be with some and, people. And it's, those of you recognize this interesting, not just call on the Lord, out of a pure heart. Yeah, so you have to recognize something in them yeah, that you say, you might not even agree with them on, on everything, but what you do recognize is that there's... They're a genuine and sincere. They're seeking the truth, aren't they? They're seeking the truth. Genuine, genuine. genuine and sincere. Yeah, yeah. So, so I'm just saying that as an important process, because what's going to happen is I've envisaged in the future that more and more Christians who are sound ish will start moving away from organized church yeah yeah they're going to move away from because look if you i'm sorry if you yeah, look exactly. at the organized church it's a mess going. Well, exactly. and that's why we have a great responsibility responsibility yeah. here at this church because we are a i would call a mainline church in the general sense of being a baptist church but we have a responsibility because we provide what a mainline church provides but we have a responsibility to stand for the truth and, and because when, because we, what's going to happen is you're going to have side groups that have yeah. to start because the mainline church is gone. I mean, the Anglican church is gone. It's gone. And, and years ago, it's in Barlow Baptist Church, you could focus totally on mine. Totally. And it's not included to be on church. Yeah, but now, know. we have to, I see yeah. for us, God's call Kenneth and us to actually be wider than Marla. Yeah, we don't Our have the luxury. We don't have the luxury of Marla only. We don't. Especially not with what's happened. Exactly. Because, because I mean, literally, Vera said one of someone she knows um basically is involved in the church and she baked cupcakes for pride month that's and that's that's well exactly what i'm saying it's, that's the serious issues we're dealing with because not out of pure heart it's not those that are not involved in false teaching and this is not to be condemning or i'm just saying it's a general thing like that yeah. is not what is godly no, no, and you want to stay away from it so that's the issues we're dealing with yeah that's the world we're in. That world. Exactly. Miriam says, where do I go? If, you know, and there's others out there. Right? Yeah, I know there are people out there who are speaking to people. 100%. Yeah. Who don't um, yep. church. Okay. And I mean, I was in that position when I had this unlawful relationship with the Methodist church. So unlawful. Yeah. It was unsatisfactory. Yeah. No, 100%. Yeah, 100%. 100%. Yeah. And then that's why even hope, like a home group can work. Makes sense. Yeah. Because it just yeah, needs to be two or three yeah. or four people yeah. together. It doesn't have to be a building. Right. But right. it's accountability. It is basically being able to study God's word and spending time together. So in the in, in the difficult sense, it can happen in a small group. Yeah. But that's why we have a responsibility here as our church, because we've got a great building, great facilities. We have a responsibility to still be a bastion. Yeah. Because it's going to be, it leads to disillusionment when you constantly open the newspapers or the internet and you just see the church towing the line of the world. It, it makes yeah. people disillusioned. That's right. And also, you know, just if we get down into another lockdown situation, what do we do? Exactly. We need to think about meeting. Well, goodness. You know, <laughs> even if they stop, so yeah, we exactly. will meet. We will so home groups, home groups is fine, but there just yeah. needs to be accountability. My issue yeah. just is, is there must always be accountability with what's being taught and what people are encouraged in. Yeah. So let's look at Absolutely. verse 23, and it says then, but avoid those. So so what must be happening, you must be with those with a pure heart, uh, flee youthful us, pursue righteousness, but also avoid foolish and ignorant disputes. Now, I don't know what that means. None, because the problem is, we can have an idea of what that means. I don't fully know what that means. Makes sense. Because we can also, oh, I think this is that or that. I don't know what Paul meant. When he wrote that to Timothy 2000 years ago, because what in our con so we can come with our, our English mind or our concept of what we think foolish is, what we think ignorant is, and what disputes are. We, we can all come up with ideas of that, but that's not the issue. The issue just is 
that if we are not focused on God's word, so anything that leads us away from God's word, anything that poses a threat to God's word, because remember, the Bible wasn't written when Paul wrote this. So there was a lot of conversations, that happened, but it wasn't centered on God's word. So my, I just, I just yeah. stole this quote from from a commentary that I that I use um, for certain things, and it says, "The church is filled with hot heads and cold hearts." You said that. Uh, oh, you said. That. No, no, no. So I, I, this is a quote. Don't, so, don't go after hot heads in brackets, Kenny. No, <laughs> no, but, but but it says that if 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 you've got hot heads and cold hearts, which is a dangerous thing, because what happens is, no. if it's someone. If it's someone that just always wants to be right, yeah, and not actually yeah, right. concerned about the truth, yeah. then it's a problem. Could we take one um, you just said in Oh, hundred percent, hundred percent, spot on. Spot idle, just hundred percent, because they're taking people away, and 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 we just have to be again. Yeah. It's it's a difficult thing, but that's why I encourage myself and I encourage us as the church to be pastoral. The greatest blessing to the church will be if we have more than one pastor in how we think and function. Yes, I have the responsibility of being the teacher. I get that from, from a biblical sense. But the way that we think, the, the congregation cannot think differently mm -hmm. from how pastors should think. And how you should think is, it's not always about being right mm -hmm. in my argument. Yes, biblically, the Bible is right. Yeah. But we have to think pastorally what's best for the person and showing that care and compassion for them spiritually. Not just avoiding conflict either. So please don't get that idea. Oh, the best for people is just to avoid conflict. No, sometimes I go there to an awkward mm. place. I don't back off yeah. there. But my concern is what is best for you because you're thinking, yeah, yeah it's dangerous. Yeah. So what we need to do is think pastorally, but what we must try and avoid yeah. are things that are foolish discussions, yeah. worthless yeah. things, yeah. and ignorant disputes. I love ignorant. You don't know what you're talking about. Yeah. And there are many people that have... Uh, basically um, the wrong end of the stick biblically and they have ideas and those ideas are not biblical. I'm sorry. In our church, I'm going to get super direct if someone wants to debate things and don't know what they're talking about. Yeah. Makes sense. Yeah. I'm sorry. We're going to say sorry. That, unfortunately, I'm not going to back off on that. But if someone is genuine and want to ask, ask a question, all of us must give them that time. But if someone is going to think they're clever and cause a problem, then you're going to have to deal with it in the church. Yeah. Makes sense. Because we can't afford that. But see, knowing things is going to just cause trouble and engender strife. Now, again, that's the context is very important. Why? Because if, if the minister is doing something that's not right and someone questions that, they are not engendering strife. So that's not saying that the minister can just do whatever he wants and anyone that questions him now is a troublemaker. That's not what this is talking about. So please, that's what I'm saying. Don't create your own concept of what this is. Because I've just seen it too much where ministers and leaders in the church, whether it's elders or committees or whatever, do their own thing, start taking the church down an ungodly path. And there's a person there that knows the word that stands up in a meeting and says, but this is not biblical, it's not right. No. And then everyone cuts them off because they're just a troublemaker. No, that's not what this is talking about. This is talking about people that are coming in that don't know what they're talking about biblically, and spiritually are detrimental. Okay, I mean, and they cause strife. In this context, I mean, on, on one of these forums, some of the people on our group um, in our church, and uh, there's this, I don't know if anyone's heard of Hugo Talk, because it's a sort of kind of thing, but he's talking about all the nonsense going on. So yeah, yeah, a, a lot of it, we can all buy. You know, he talks against the same sex, the LGBT stuff, or, you know, loads of stuff a lot of us agree with. But just really, he's supposed to become a believer but now, and then literally just in the last 12 months, and now and now he's teaching, Christian teaching, and he's called, he's saying, don't believe in this deception, the rapture, and the dispensation. And it's like, what? You know, and, and the thing, the, so it's like, um, it's just sort of, um, you know, he's right, and there's sort of no one else is wrong. And he's but he's 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 he doesn't, he doesn't know what he's talking about. Exactly. 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 And that's why you've got to take time biblically to know what you're talking about and be able to be, be comfortable with the scriptures and talk about it. You can't just come up with, I heard, no. the, I heard this from someone. Yeah. It doesn't count. Mm -hmm. You need to know what you're talking about. Yeah. But let's look at verse 24. It goes on and says, 
And now, now, now Paul is specifically speaking to Timothy. And he says, and a servant of the Lord must not quarrel. So don't you don't have to fight with people and cause strife. You don't. Yep. Because if you argue with a fool, it's two fools argue. <laughs> so, and a servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but be gentle. Now, gentle is important. Why the word gentle? What does that mean? I reiterate this. The word gentle there in Greek refers more to holding a bird yeah. than a child. So don't look at a child, oh, that child's gentle. That's what I'm talking about. Gentle comes from a place of strength, but chooses to temper that strength. So the, you hold a bird tight enough so it doesn't fly away, right. but you have the potential of crushing it, but you yeah. don't. So Jesus was gentle. He's God. You could just wipe everyone out. Makes yeah. sense. He could just cut everyone down, but he chooses to limit that to show grace and gentleness. If the Christian must be gentle toward others because if someone comes and asks a question or someone is doing something that's not always appropriate or difficult, you must show that gentleness with you. You can actually come and even quote 600 yeah. scriptures. It doesn't always help just to quote scripture to some people. Some people you must leave. Yeah. Makes sense. Yeah. Don't always try and just cut them down. That's not gentle. Gentle is, I know what the word says, and I can give you so, sort of quiet encouragement in this area, but I'm not using the Bible or using my knowledge or using my spiritual prowess to cut mm -hmm. you down and show my show how great I make sense. So gentleness is pastoral in the fact that you've got to let people talk. If someone asks a question to me as the pastor and it's something that you know you should know, I don't go, oh, how do you not know this? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Makes yeah, sense. Yeah. You don't do that. Yeah. Because that's not gentle. Uh, Makes sense. Yeah. Gentle is like I'm going, mm, yeah, you should know this. Yeah, but, but I'm still yeah. going to show that. Yeah, so yeah. that's so that's right. what, what the shepherd would, must do. Would, be, would it be equivalent to meekness? Well? Yeah, meekness is more humility. So meekness oh, is directly humility. Gentleness is directly to a position of strength, but choosing to limit how you exercise that. Right. Makes sense. Out of wisdom. Meekness is just showing that humility. Gentleness right. is not humility. Okay. Gentleness is okay. yeah. treating the person, wrapping them in cotton wool, because that's the best for them. Right. You know, that's the sort of context. Right. So past has to be gentle. Don't always be harsh. Yeah. Don't always want to exercise authority. Even a father in a home, a, a, a father that has to tell his children and his wife to respect his authority has lost the battle. You don't have to tell people to respect you. Makes yeah. sense because yeah, then yeah, that's, yeah. No, no, you, no. you you have to show the character that yeah. is worthy of respect. If you don't, yeah, and you have to then resort to pushing them down to show that respect. Already, there's something that's wrong. If that makes sense. So gentleness is just showing godliness and care and concern, but you are actually strong enough to actually crush the person with either your knowledge or your position or whatever. But you choose to not do right. it. And that's what we, we hope our, you know, um, the government does. The, gov the, gov the government should, what they should do is say, we're in this position, but we're not going to use it. We're going to allow the people and, and create a positive symbiotic relationship, which is not what governments are doing now. It's basically keep quiet or there's trouble. That's on how a government, government should be gentle as well. Yes, you've given them authority. Yes, they can actually act, but they choose to temper that because it's what's best for the people. But they don't function like that. No. Pastorally, you've got to function like that. And even as Christians, we have to. Why? Because in the church, there are people that are growing still, that might not know what we know, yeah. that are really asking genuine questions. And if they feel that they're going to be either patronized or cut off when they're asking those questions, it's not very gentle. And so what he's talking about pastorally, so he's saying, a servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but be gentle. Yeah. Um, even uh, it, it, it must be possible to be gentle, but not to go beyond boundaries. The boundaries clear. Yeah, 100%. 100%. 100%. It doesn't mean, oh, well, I will not argue and that's what no, I won't tell them they No. But it's also how you, again, how you do it. You do so it. it's all about showing that gent gentleness yeah. is not weakness, it's not, exactly. it's not compromise. At all, no. it's these are the boundaries, but the way that I do it is it's like you treat how you treat a child, yeah. makes sense. You, so, again, it's just what the pastor must do pastorally. So, if you've been to a church where the pastor is constantly walking around telling everyone about his position, then you know that there's a problem. 
Makes sense. He's not, you're not, I'm not supposed to walk around saying, I'm the pastor, you must respect me. I mean, who does that? <laughs> Makes sense. No, no, no. You don't call me Kenneth. You call me pastor. <laughs> I've worked hard for that title. Yeah. Goodness me. People like that, I just like cheers. I don't, I don't have time for you. I'm sorry. Have a nice day. So look what it says here. It says you must be gentle to all and be able to teach yeah. patience. Makes sense. So you have to be show that patience. Yeah. Makes sense. But yeah. patience in accordance to where the person is. So that means let's let's use a child for example. I have to be patient with Harry because he's learning all certain like with maths and things. I'm not going to show the same patience to Harry as a 16 year old. Makes sense. Mm -hmm. You show different patience with a 16 year old as you do with a seven year old. Yeah. If the 15 year old, the 16 year old is still functioning like Harry, that's a problem. Makes sense. But at what is appropriate at the age, you show that patience. You don't expect too much of a person at seven years old. Yeah. And, and understand what I'm saying? So it doesn't mean that you facilitate lack of growth mm -hmm. and sort of like, oh, it's fine, doesn't matter. No, it does matter. That's where you come in and say, well, this is not how it should be. What are we going to do going forward? You can show patients like that as well. So please, it's all about, again, as, as Miriam so rightly pointed out, yeah. it is about boundaries. It's also about yeah. appropriate. So if someone's been a Christian for 30 years and they still don't know, then it's a serious issue. Yeah. We have to say, okay, but, but are you listening to what, yeah. what is being taught? Yeah. And I'm not saying that in a negative way. I'm saying, well, we have to then spend time. No, that's right. Yeah. And if, if it means people phoning me up and saying I need a one-on-one, -on -one, they must do that. Yeah, I don't have enough of that, by the way. I don't have people phoning me up saying I need a one-on-one -on -one hour with you, and that's my job. <laughs> Makes sense because if someone in the class, if you've got a class of school kids, and yeah. one of them must, needs more attention, you need to give that attention. Yeah. Not so. Yeah. You can't just say, "Well, it doesn't matter." It matters. Sorry. I mean, Kenny. Yeah, I mean, it's in, twenty-three and twenty-four. They're so linked together, aren't they? It's like, you go a little bit back to what Miriam was saying as well. Is that? You know, that you need to detect this when it says avoid foolish discussion. If you detect the spirit where it's an argument, spirit, then you avoid it. That's what they're saying. But if there's a, when we say dispute, you talk about dispute, you know, if there's a sort of kind of genuine area that you might, there might be a difference. It's not but disagreement's not dispute. No. Dispute means conflict I mean, unnecessary. Yeah. And that's. Disagreement yeah. means I don't agree with you, but it's okay. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Just a bit. Well, no, 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 no. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've had that. I've, to be honest, I've had, uh, ministers get that a lot. Every minister in every church will get that. You get some people that want to, you know, they want to catch you out because yeah. it's like a clever match. Mm -hmm. That's not how it works. So let's look at verse 25. So, in humility, see, see, you have patience, and now in humility, correcting those who are in opposition. So the pastor has the responsibility, and it comes back to what Miriam said as well. The pastor still has the responsibility in gentleness and humility to do what? To correct. Yeah. To correct those in opposition. Yeah, see, so you, it's not that you don't. No, yeah. exactly. You can correct, yeah. but it's just how you do it, because we yeah. all know. And the, the difficulty is this is a big issue for me. If you've got someone that is under gets under your skin. With it, and I'm talking about pastors and this for pastors of people in the church. If you're going to get into a debate with them and they already get under your skin for months and months and months, it's just not going to go well. No, I can see where this is going. It's going to go to a conflict situation, not because of the con, no. not because of the subject matter then, but because of the build up. Yeah. So, my advice would always be if there's someone that gets under your skin, you've got to pray for them, yeah. you've got to pray for yourself and them. So that when you get to a conversation that God gives you the wisdom and that you know I've prayed about this yeah. rather than it being a situation that gets, gets difficult. And that's pastorally as well. Why? Look at what the verse says. So you correct those who are in opposition. If God perhaps will grant them repentance so that they may know the truth. And what's important about verse 25, Paul is not dealing here with unbelievers. He's dealing with believers. The context here has got nothing. You can do like with nothing's jumped. No, no, nothing's jumped now to unbelievers. No. So the repentance that needs to be granted here, that they may know the truth, is to believers who are in false teaching. Verse 16, yeah. 17, 18. Makes sense. So, so the repentance is of their error in because you've shown them in the word that I'm wrong. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, exactly. So here it's saying that 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 God will open their eyes through his word, of course, because if you show people scripture, they go and read it, yeah. some, the penny will just drop. And that's happened. How many people? Yeah. There's a verse that someone gave them or a passage, and they read it and said, like, I mean, I have that. I have yeah. I, Some things I have never seen. When someone points it out to me, I go and I'm like, I've never seen that. Yeah. And that's why. But the key here is why must we be gentle? Why must we be patient? Why must we do this in humility? So it gives you the opportunity of helping. Mm -hmm. If you're going to be not gentle and you're going to be aggressive and quarrelsome and difficult, you might never get the opportunity to help so that there can be repentance. Mm -hmm. You've got to buy yourself some time to get to the place. And if it's not going to be you, it's fine. But then you become a vessel again of dishonor and God has to sort of put you to the side and bring someone else on that person's path. And you've missed the opportunity because it's such an important place to be when someone, like for ourselves and them, when your eyes are open to something in God's word and you're just like so thankful and can see the Holy Spirit working in the lives of believers in all of our lives. Because there are mm -hmm. things that we don't know yet. There are things that we have wrong concepts about that God will correct through his word, through mm -hmm. faithful preaching, faithful teaching, faithful studying, God will open our eyes to many things. Mm -hmm. But if we are going to be an obstacle to that, it's difficult. So that's why I say the key here is humility. And humility means that I also don't know him. Yeah. Makes sense. Because if, if, I, if I think I know everything, then God can't teach me something. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's why we move to verse 26. And that they may. Just as an aside here, I think it's really a challenge for each one of us that, you know, when we look over the last even few years, can we think of things where, wow, before I didn't understand that. Now I've heard you know, teaching or whatever. Yeah, now I have a quite a different view of that now. Than that. And if you, if you can't claim that, you, you know, even though I think, are you really growing in the Lord? I would argue, you know? Definitely, I think for all of us. You know. And that's what verse 26 then concludes, and that they may come to their senses <laughs> and escape the snare of the devil, having been taken captive by him to do his will. Can believers do the will of the devil? Yes, he can. Mm, can. Yeah. And what is the will of the devil? Just, you know, to, to cause difficulty before you come to faith, and then even for the church to cause problems in the church. It's always destruction. Makes sense, destruction, wherever it goes. And so, again, this is not talking about unbelievers. It's just saying that when people are involved in false teaching, it's the work of the devil. And, and throughout the scriptures, what does it say in First Timothy 4? It's doctrines of demons. Yeah. Demonic things. And when it says doctrine of demons, not talking about people are fixated upon demons and stuff. It's just saying that the doctrines are coming... Yeah. From okay. Satan. And what are those doctrines? It will always feed self. It will always take you away from God's word. It will always be about what you think is best. It will yeah. always be based on religion rather than grace. Those are doctrines of demons. Because Satan wants you to think that you're good enough. Satan wants you to facilitate your own growth. That's what he wants you to do because then it becomes about you. And everything biblically needs to be about his Christ's work and God's work in us. Not because we are doing it. Okay. Mm. So are there any questions? I just want to, um, I'm just going to close in prayer and then we can do some questions. It's just easier for the recording. Let's pray and thank the Lord for this time. Father, we thank you for your word and we thank you for your truth and what you've shared with us and help us, Lord, to continue to hear your word, to read your word and to grow in grace. In your wonderful name, we pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Amen.